today I have a rock star on the show. James Whitaker is on. He's a three times best selling author, speaker, and entrepreneur. He's interviewed more than 300 of the world's leading athletes, entrepreneurs, and business leaders to unlock their, their secrets to success. He's going to share all of this with us. His books have been translated into more than 10 languages. The, uh, his book, Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy, is a modern companion to the best-selling help, self-help book of all time. He is passionate about helping entrepreneurs and C-level executives win the day every single day. So make sure that you share this out. We're going to talk about the Think and Grow Rich movie that he created, produced. Uh, all kinds of cool stuff is coming. So make sure you share this out. We'll be right back with James Whitaker in just a moment. And we are back. Let me bring James on. James, welcome to the show. I am here. How you doing, Ken? Great to see you, my man. Man, I am so excited to have you on. I, I told you I have a trip coming up as soon as we're done here, but I, I thought I, if it would have been anybody else, I would have <laughs> rescheduled, man. But I'm like, I'm not rescheduling James Whitaker. No way. So, this will give you some energy for the, for the road trip. I, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to have you on. Um, we met out at Ramey's house and, um, that was a phenomenal event for Don Green and Napoleon Hill foundation. And, um, I, I know a little bit about you, but not a lot about you. I love the movie that you put out a few years ago, the Think and grow rich movie. It's incredible. Um, but let's start with, before we get to that, let's talk about where you were born and raised. Uh, Brisbane, Australia. That's that's my accent. 39 years old now. I, I moved to the US when I was 28 years old. But uh, yeah, born and raised in, in Brisbane, Australia. And it, it was a it's a beautiful part of the world, a lot of really nice beaches. And anyone who, who loves the outdoors, then, then Australia is a great place to be. So that's that's how I grew up, was, was running around barefoot, uh, which my daughter, who's three years old, replicates in, in Los Angeles. So her preschool teachers keep telling me every day, you need to get your daughter to, to learn to put her shoes back on. Um, but that, <laughs> that was it, a, a beautiful part of the world. I'm, I'm very grateful to have had an upbringing that enabled so much outdoor access and, and a love of nature. You know, I, I don't know if I, I don't think I told you this. Maybe I did. My 12 year old daughter is literally obsessed with Australia. <laughs> did I tell you that? I, I think you did. Yeah, yeah, I think you she's, did. She's obsessed, dude. I mean, I, I, she, <laughs> she's like, she's got this plan. She's going to go help marsupials in the zoo when she grew up it's just I, like okay so so um so when so you were there did you end up did you go to college over there or, or i did university? yeah so yeah i finished high school and i i just i didn't really know what the path was for me and it's a question that i see a lot of people ask people in high school i still do that instinctively it frustrates me when whenever it comes out of my mouth that question of what do you want to be when you're older? And I had no idea what I wanted to be when I was older. And, and really the high school uh, education system, and I, you know, I'm very grateful. I went to a, a really good school. Um, but to me, it, it, it really feels like it put me in, in two different categories. It's like there are people who are smart and there are people who are stupid. And I felt like I was one of the people based on what we call the OP score, the overall positioning score, yeah. um, that I was not one of the, the smart people, which of course made me one of the, the stupid people. So when you, you have that moment there of you can, you're greatly restricted in terms of the university courses that you can get into. And it's, it's from that moment from school to access to university where these things, it's just like a little chip into you that, that takes away from your self-worth. So I, I did, I actually enrolled in a degree of, uh, it was a bachelor of arts majoring in English and writing, which was, you know, there weren't too many options available for me for that university that I wanted. I, I could have gone to a bunch of different universities, but I wanted to go to the ones where the one where all of my friends were, 
were going, which was called the University of Queensland. And I enrolled in, enrolled in a Bachelor of Arts majoring in English and writing and um, quickly expanded after that to add in a business component of that. And yeah. it, was, it was really through that moment um, that I realized eventually when I would go and do an MBA in the USA, just how important it is to really want to do the education that you're doing like what's the reason what's the purpose how is it equipping you and making you capable enough to solve a problem that you're really passionate about yeah. and how are you going to apply yourself to get that result i've done a whole bunch of, of different educational programs i've got two bachelor degrees a diploma and an advanced diploma of financial services and now a master's of business administration and i don't have them anywhere no one has ever seen a degree of mine sitting anywhere because they don't mean anything to me but things like relationships, they mean so much to me. So relationships is really, and, and that um, the notion that the most important opinion is how you feel about yourself. These yeah. are the things that mean a lot more to me than a piece of paper. You know, what's interesting is, and Joe Ingram's being funny. He said, is it just my YouTube or is he talking <laughs> funny? <laughs> Maybe both, Joe. Maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that, that, I, so I had Brian Tracy on the show, uh, I don't know, four or five, six months ago. Um, and, and he was my hero because I, I walked out of high school in 12th grade and never went back, didn't go to college. And I always felt like a loser for a long time. Right. And, and I'm like, and then I remember at like 23, 24 years old, I heard Brian Tracy's story and I'm like, He's a high school dropout too. Yes, <laughs> there's a chance. And, and, you know, I just think about that. And I think about how um, we, we put so much pressure on kids at that, that young age to figure out what they're going to be. And I, I, I just, I don't know, man. I, I don't think that's cool. I don't, I don't think it's cool we do that to our kids. Yeah, I, I agree. And I interviewed uh, a guy called Simon T. Bailey, who's an amazing speaker. And he, uh, he actually said to me, um, the best thing to do is to ask kids, what problem do you want to solve? Or what problem will you put on this earth to solve rather mm -hmm. than what you want to be when you're older? And I was like, whoa, that is, that is great. I'm going to borrow that one. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So you said you came to the U S and did your MBA here. Um, how, what, where did that all happen? How, I mean, were you in Australia your whole life just hoping that someday you could move to the U S <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's an interesting question because a lot of people from Australia go over to the UK and I yeah. just had no, des literally zero desire to go on, you know, crap weather and and all the other you know they follow yeah. soccer and all these different things that don't do a great deal uh, don't do a great deal for me so uh, i always thought that america was you know such a like the epicenter of the world in so many ways and i wasn't really thinking about it in terms of the bigger picture at that point i actually enrolled in an mba because i wanted to go and get a job and go down that consulting route and work um, really long hours with really cool companies and yeah. entering that MBA program that was nine months in Boston in Massachusetts. So I was there during the, um, the year that the marathon bombing was on and, and my girlfriend at the time was actually running in that, um, in that wow. marathon and I was supposed to meet her at the finish line except I had a university because it was a public holiday except I had a university um, activity that was on that day. Otherwise, there's a you know very good chance, almost certainty, that I would have been there when the bombing went off. Wow! And um, the entering the MBA, it made me realize. It just, you know, you can do these programs with the best of intentions, but it's like a washing machine. It just, you know, spins you around and just spits you out in a completely opposite direction. And that direction for me was entrepreneurship because that year in Boston and then the three months in Shanghai, it was the first time that I'd really been around entrepreneurs at such a high concentration. People who yeah. were my age and younger who were getting after it with whatever they wanted to do in terms of creating their business and wanting to solve that problem and acquiring resources like funding. They were doing their pitching rounds and refining their concepts. So with some friends, we would, we would meet till four in the morning and have a couple of beers and eat pizza. And the amount of business concepts that I have still sitting on, on a Word document, hundreds and hundreds of them that have never seen the light of day that are 
some of them are pretty funny as well. Like I was going to start a mobile app company at one stage. I was going to create a, a company that had every single menu in the world from every restaurant that you could just go and access. Obviously, things like that have been incorporated now into, into Yelp and a whole bunch of other ones. But yeah. so, many, so many different things like that. But that was the entrepreneurial journey. And it was after that where I then went and started my own businesses, which led to so many other things. And um, to sort of tie all that in with Think and Grow Rich, the movie, it was only when I had sat down with people who had kicked off that project and they just said to me, look, we love your energy. We need to have you involved in this project in some capacity. How will we, like, you know, how can we make that happen? And I basically said to them, well, there's a book about, you know, the Think and Grow Rich book is 13 principles. Um, why don't you write a new book and release it alongside the movie where you introduce each principle in a modern context and tell the stories of people who have been able to personify that principle because people these days just don't identify as much with your Thomas Edison's, your Henry Ford's. You know, they like all the people who are in the movie like Barbara Corker and Rob Deerdeck because they see them on TV constantly. Yeah. And that's where they said, come on board, write the book, be executive producer of the film. And that was the moment for me when I was like, wow, this is the, the journey into personal development and a, a journey that I think I'll be in for the rest of my life. So I guess, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I have like 15 <laughs> questions hitting my mind at once. What, what, um, what qualified you to do that? I, I guess is really like where where did the qualifications come from? Yeah, good question. So I had about uh, more than ten years in the financial planning world before that. Okay. So I'd run an advisor team um, okay. with more than two billion dollars under management. I'd already written a um, a best selling book on personal finance and and motivation and personal development that was named Book of the Month by Money Magazine and had done really well in Australia. So that was the I already had those runs on the board. And at the time when I had had the meeting with the people who had kicked off the film project, I'd also started, I think, about four separate companies at that point. So I, I had a lot of real world um, business experience, which experience isn't the best teacher. It's the only teacher, as they say. Yeah. And I'd, I'd also interviewed uh, an enormous array of people for different projects and things that I've, that I've been involved in. Now, that being said, that still didn't, at least in my mind, qualify me as someone enough to write a modern companion to the best-selling self-help book of all time. I mean, this is a Napoleon Hill Foundation uh, right, project. Right. Um, so the the goal with that really was just, look, let's not overthink it. We're not writing a substitute. We're writing a companion. I need to do it in my own way. If this is one big lofty goal, what's the best way to achieve that? Well, it's to break it down into different goals, uh, into like smaller goals. And that would be what's each chapter going to be about? What is, you know, what are we going to include in each chapter? Who are we going to interview? What are their stories? Let's go and have those interviews. And what came through? How does the story need to change? And then putting it all together. I wrote that book in I think it's about 70 or 80,000 words. I wrote that in nine months with more than half a million words in research notes. It was a really fast paced scramble, but I, you know, I'm writing as something that I've just always been pretty good at um, naturally. Joe, and I, I, this is actually kind of a funny, it's funny, but it's a good question too. So you faked it. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think, I mean, I, you kind of, when you're on an endeavor that you've never really done, you kind of have to, like, at to some level, right? Well, there's something I've been thinking about so much lately. I don't know if you're a Top Gun fan, but Top Gun was is my favorite movie of all time. The original oh. Top Gun. There's a there's a scene there. I, I I think you know, 30 years on, I can I I don't have to say spoiler alert for what happens in the in the first movie, but yeah. there's the mo there's a moment where, where what happens with Goose, you know what happens with Goose. Yeah. And then Maverick is having that that moment where he's trying to figure out what's going on, and um, Viper said, "Is it Viper?" I, uh, who said, just keep sending him up, just keep sending him up. And that's, that's what I love. And that's something that I've done my entire life. It doesn't matter what has happened, what adversity I have faced or what I've, what challenge I've gone through or what's in front of me or how hard I have been hit. I have this voice in my head that says, keep sending him up. And that's what I do. I just keep standing up and moving forward. I'm, I'm not getting overwhelmed by these opportunities. I'm just yeah. trying to add as much value in the present as I can. So the, the goal is not to write the book. The goal is to say, if I'm interviewing Sharon Lecter, how can I give her the best interview that she's ever done? And then how can I tell that story in the best possible way? And then once that is done 26 times for all the people in the book, how can I promote this in the best way possible? And that's what's led to 
companies like Success Magazine reaching out and saying, can you be a speaker for our Speakers Bureau and writing more, more books with the Napoleon Hill Foundation and a bunch of other things like that. But I think that Top Gun line of keep sending them up is something, something interesting we all need to remember. Amen, man. Because you don't, it, it, you just, you don't know all the steps, how they're going to unfold. You just have to take that first step and, and, and go. I, do you know, I, I'm, I'm, I would imagine, you know, Ben Gay, the third, um, he actually worked with Napoleon Hill years ago. Bob Donnell's on here watching with us as well. Um, so, so, so you, um, back back up a little bit so you came over you got your you, you got an mba right you you got and and you got in you said you got into the financial um, planning world for a while um i just don't i i'm because i know writing books i've written some myself writing books and and making movies have really nothing to do with financial planning. Um, <laughs> I, I can I, I can map it I can map it out for you better, maybe Ken. So um, yeah. after after high school, that's when I started working. And my my you know my family's been in in financial planning, so I feel like I've been in financial planning for my entire life because okay. you know at eight years old I was selling um, books at the events that my my dad was speaking at. That was like really my my education for for entrepreneurship. So I was involved in in financial planning in a whole different array of, of roles and, and exposure to different companies and all of that type of thing. But it was when I moved to America when I was 28 years old, that is where I farewelled the financial services industry and, uh, and never went back. I've, I've done, you know, I've helped people in, in different ways and it's a handy skill to have because yeah, sure. I'm a qualified financial advisor. I just never have been. I've, I've managed the advisor teams. So it was from that moment, that's when I started launching my own businesses. So the first business launched actually during the MBA program because I wanted to use it as a case study. It was a social media brand um, in the fitness realm that, that did really well. We had, I think, like half a million, uh, we built a community of about half a million people on, on yeah. social media. And then we turned that into a um, one of the world's largest CrossFit gyms that was based in Australia that has had professional sporting teams and, and some of the most recognized people in the fitness world, um, wow. people from the NFL and all that who have, who have come down there. It's the fourth largest largest CrossFit gym in the world. Uh, and then we launched a clothing company on the back of that that sponsored people in the Commonwealth Games, the Olympic Games and the CrossFit Games. Um, and then after that, you know, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, I feel like I've launched products and companies in just about every industry um, yeah. you can think of. So I'm a bit of a Swiss army knife in terms of <laughs> different industries and having coached so many people in uh in, in different industries as well it's uh yeah it's 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 interesting it's it's sort of a, a tough elevator pitch at times that's why i focus on just helping people win the day that's that's much more simple than than this eclectic background that we're talking about you know i think uh, i mean i've been an entrepreneur <clears throat> excuse me my entire adult life and i think that you know i look at people that have so much potential to, to own their own business, do phenomenal things, but they're really attached to a paycheck. And I can't relate to that. Like, I don't know if you're like me or I, I cannot relate to a guaranteed paycheck and clocking in and clocking out. But there are people <laughs> like that, that they really want to do their own thing. What do you think? I, I mean, what do you think it holds people to that paycheck and not going out and 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 pursuing what they're really here for well i think there are people who find meaning in working for someone else now this is a this has been a big journey that i have that i have been on i reached a point when i became my own boss for the first time where i thought this is the only way to be happy. The only way to be happy is to figure out what's the problem that you want to solve. Who are the people that you want to solve that for? Take holidays whenever you, you want to do that. Pay yourself whatever you want. Hire whoever right. you want. I thought that was the only way to be happy. Right. And then you know, fast forward a few more years on the entrepreneurial journey where you can see all the perils of all of those different things. I mean, there are so many things that can go wrong on that entrepreneurial journey. Like It is unbelievably tough. Every time I feel like I... Uh, I, I would never sort of verbalize it, but you know, sometimes when you've, you've been on the grind for so long that you think to yourself, God, this has got to be, this has to be a win. Like I've, I've, I've done the reps. I've, I've, you know, I've eaten all the shit I've done. I've done everything. I'm, I'm ready for 
success in this field and inevitably something comes out and it's a hundred times or 500 times harder than you, than you think it's going to be. I think you need to find meaning in whatever it is that you're doing. I had a guy who tried to a- apply for, for something that, um, that I was running a couple of years back, like a really high level coaching program that would have cost him a lot of money. And I asked him what his goals were. And his goal was to have enough money to be able to pay for his daughter's high school. And he was wondering whether or not he should go and open a restaurant and I said to him, and what he was doing at the moment, he was, a, he was doing long hours as a um, corporate cleaner. So he was going and cleaning offices and, and that type of thing. Yeah. And I had told him, I said, you have enough money to pay for your daughter's high school right now? And he said, yes. And I said, the, the thing that you need to do, if that's your big goal is to put your daughter in high school, is to suck it up and do that. And then once she's out of high school, that is your opportunity to be able to go and do something else. To go on, go all in. He might have had the, the best passion ever for having his own restaurant, but the risk that that could bring on could destroy him, could ruin the one goal that he has in terms of his daughter's education and could completely derail his life that could lead to divorce, losing the family home, all of these, these different things. So when you're yeah. clear on what that win is, and just making sure that you can find meaning in those those different things. It's it's taken me a long time to um, to be able to to do that. Um, that being said, I don't think I could ever go back and uh, and work for someone else ever again. I just I don't think I'm I don't think I'm wired like that. And I think there are there's a certain uh, percentage of the population who isn't wired like that. But if you're one of those people who isn't wired like that, you know, the, 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 the black sheep, the people who don't fit in with, with the rest of the flock, you need to get unbelievably good at two attributes and nothing else. And that's resourcefulness, meaning that you can acquire all of the resources that you need, things like relationships, money, all of those different things that you need to make your wildest dreams come true and resilience. So when life kicks you in the ass, as it does for all of us, that you can keep moving forward And find the gift in this because something I I, I mention in speeches all the time is how you respond when adversity inevitably strikes is what separates ordinary people from extraordinary achievers. It's the truth. I'll I'll never forget. um, I had a situation with employees that was bad and, and Grant Cardone was him and I were talking a lot and he, he said, you need to clean house. And I'm like, (laughs) I can't man. Like they, (laughs) they actually do some important tasks and long story short, he called me after my, my vice president resigned and he's like, congrats on the VP quitting, man. Now you can go. And I'm like, (laughs) you don't understand. Hell is on like, it's raining down on me right now. But you know, I I think that, you know, you're right. You, you, I, I, I always wonder like, and I don't know if you're like this or not, but I always wonder, like, why, why don't people look for that greater purpose? Like, I, I don't understand ordinary and I, I'm not, I'm not bashing it in any way. I know that there are people who are just happy in life, clocking in, clocking out 40 hours, whatever, but I just can't relate to that. I I don't understand it. Yeah, there's, there's people. That, so there are some, to give you an example of someone who can find an enormous amount of meaning in their day without needing to have their own wildest entrepreneurial aspirations, the people that I'm thinking of there would be mothers, people who stay at home with their kids who can raise the next generation. Like it's, it's the most important job is making sure that we can usher in the next generation as leaders. And sure. the people that you're mentioning there, these are the ones who I, you know, you might be driving and you see it's like, you know, seven or eight in the morning and they're drinking those giant cans of mother energy drink. Like they're destroying the health before the day has even begun. And they're, you know, they're popping outside for, for cigarette breaks and they're just going through the, the motions each and every single day. I just, I have, I have nothing in common with those people and I have right. no desire to be around those people in any capacity. Um, right. John Asaraf from The Secret, I asked him once, how, how do you, like there's a lot of people in the world that need help and you're someone, Ken, who wants to help. Uh, Bob Donnell, who's on here before, yeah. who, he, he really wants to help a lot of people. I really yeah. want to help a, a bunch of people. Yeah. And if we try and pull all of those people up who aren't ready for the help, then they're going to end up pulling us down. And we're going to get burnt out and having conversations for 45 minutes with a whole bunch of different people thinking uh, where ego gets in the way for us, where we think, look, I'm really going to change this person's life with one 45 (laughs) minute conversation. John asked, I asked John Asaraf, like, what do you do in that situation? And he said, 
help the people who want the help, not the people who need the help. And I was like, oh, that is such a brilliant way to put it. Help the people who want the help, the ones who said, yes, I want change. I want to believe in something greater. I'm ready for your help. And I will show you through my actions or an investment if required or whatever they're going to do. Um, I just recorded a podcast on this. People admire um, heart. And when you, they admire heart and they admire hustle. And if yeah. someone, I don't care what job you have or, or where you're at in your career, if you show me through your actions that you have heart and you have hustle and you want to get to a, a bigger picture, I will do everything I can. But there could be someone who doesn't display those two attributes and they could talk the talk, but you know, you can just tell straight away they're not ready for it and they are not the people you need to focus on. I know, uh, <laughs> but I have that, I have that, um, obsession with changing their minds. <laughs> like, no, you really do. Like you don't even like, it's so cool up here at the top of the mountain. You got to come man. And they're like, <laughs> you know, bah, no, we're happy down here. For sure. And I, I will say, Ken, actually, I've, I've sort of, um, over the next few months, a big thing about what I want to do is really dive in even more into the, um, you know, the science of motivation. Like having interviewed, like you have so many people now, I've got like the ultimate real world practical experience of this, but I want to dive a little bit more into the science of these things. How can we incentivize desire? Desire being the first principle of think and grow rich. Napoleon yeah. Hill wrote that the starting point of all achievement yeah. is desire. So how do we incentivize desire? Mm. And that's where I think allocating resources to, um, really poor communities who have no good role models, who have no good mentors. They don't know anything else of, of what's possible. I've interviewed a, a, and, and personally coached a whole bunch of special forces operators like Navy SEALs and, and British special forces and people like that. And in almost every case, the moment they leave their special forces community, like the moment they go from active service you know, things get really pear-shaped for them because they're not around winners anymore. They don't have that discipline and that that structure. They don't have that incentive of being, they don't have a mission. Yeah. So that's what you need to do. You need to figure out what's your mission and who are the people that you're going to surround yourself with to, to, help, you move, uh, to help you move forward. I, I have a theory that people are stuck in their stories, their, their stories of BS that aren't even true. And so they don't even, they don't try as a result. Yeah. And I, I think that that's just a natural defense mechanism that, that, you know, is kind of innately built in each of us. But so, so, so go back to when you, so you wrote this book the, and, and do you have a copy of it you can hold up? Yes, I do. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, don't let's not here. I'm gonna give you full screen. Hang on, hang on. There you Think go. Think and grow rich, the legacy. Yeah. It's my uh, when I had a little less gray hair on the <laughs> on the back there. Uh, nice. And this one right here. I won't grab it because I don't want my whole bookshelf to <laughs> to yeah, fall well, down. Yeah, that's not enough. That that one there is in uh, is is thinking great at this book in in Japan. It's it's in Japanese now. I don't speak Japanese, so uh, but Don Green assures me that it is thinking great. It's a legacy in, in Japanese, and I have seen my my name mentioned in there in English characters. So it's amazing now that the book is translated in like fifteen different languages and. Um, Don just, you know, Don Green, I have an unbelievable amount of respect for. Uh, he does such an incredible job at continuing Napoleon Hill's legacy more so than anyone I believe who's who's been on this planet because he's doing all his reps behind the scenes. Yeah. He's doing things like securing the foreign rights translations to these books. So things like Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy and Outwitting the Devil and the original Think and Grow Rich can appear in countries like Brazil and, and all around the world. Dude, out Outwitting the Devil... A, unbelievable absolutely unbelievable um so so and i think um we've got you're gonna sell at least one book today <laughs> <laughs> shout out brandy <laughs> yeah make that two because i don't own the book either i'm gonna buy a, a copy so where is first it, let me ask you this is there a place where people can get a signed copy from you yeah send me an email and we'll we'll, we'll sort something out we can we can take care of that Awesome. So we'll, we'll get that. And where's your, what's the um, website address? So I can at least pop that up here. 
Yeah, go to uh, for the for the book. Like the book's available on Amazon, but for my personal one, if you want to send me an email, it's jameswitt.com, J-A-M-E-S-W-H-I-T-T.com. W-H-I-T. Do I have your name spelled wrong on here? Um, look. Is it W-I or W-H-I? WH, but I have, you know, because all my, all my, um, all my social media things for the most part are James Witt because jameswhitaker.com was already taken and it's very, very long. So a lot of people actually think my life, someone messaged me yesterday on Instagram and said, were you born in Logan County? I don't even know what Logan County is. I wrote back and said, my last name's Whitaker, not Wit, and I was born in Brisbane, Australia. So oh, I've, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. <laughs> so jameswit.com is your website too? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I've got like a contact page on there. So if anyone okay. wants to wants to reach out, that'll come. Okay. That'll come yeah, we'll me. put. I'm gonna put that up on the screen here. So so you um, so you decided to write this book, and it was based on other people wanting you to. Yep. Wow. Exactly. So these people. So they were launching the film and hadn't even thought about the book. Every single movie that has come out has a book component either before or at exactly the same time. So I'd explain to them, this is an absolute no brainer. Now I knew literally nothing about films apart from watching Top Gun, which we, which we mentioned earlier, although I had watched Top Gun about a hundred times, but I knew yeah. nothing about the, nothing about the film business, but I realized as well during that project that knowing nothing about an industry can actually be a really big strength because you see things that other people don't see because you're not sort of tainted by, you know, I don't mean tainted in a, in a bad way. You're just looking at it, at it through a, a fresh perspective. So, um, but something I did know was the, the book industry. I knew the traditional publishing route. I knew the self-publishing route. I knew what it was like to, to do those things in, in different countries and, and had a technical background in writing. And even when I submitted the manuscript, they said that um, it's the cleanest manuscript they have seen alongside Jim Stovall's. Jim Stovall, for anyone who, you know, amazing, amazing guy. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Jim Stovall, you know, went blind at the age of eighteen and went on to write thirty best-selling books. So, uh, to be mentioned alongside that was was great. So um, that that was how it, it it all it all got involved. It was me giving them an idea for them to run with, not for me to be involved in. I said, "You've got this project that you're doing. It's an absolute no-brainer to do this." And that's when they rang me up and they said, "Can you do it?" And I said, "Yes, wow. I will knock it out of the park for you." And that's that's what happened. That's incredible, man. Yeah, um, Mark Victor Hansen's a really good friend of mine, and and he talks. They, they've he's done a lot with with um, James Stovall. That's that's amazing, man. Absolutely amazing. So what? In keeping with the theme of of this show, um, some uh, your life sounds magical, like you've had no challenges. <laughs> I have two screaming kids inside the house. So I could bring it. No, okay. <laughs> they're pretty good. Pretty good usually. Uh, no, but what are some of the things along the way that you, um, you know, I've interviewed 460, 470 people now on this show. Um, and, and I always find it curious that, that, you know, somebody like you, man, like it's, it, you've, you've reached some super high pinnacles in life and, and, you know, but what are some of the things, challenges that you've had that you were like, okay, this is it. That's a wrap. We're not getting through this. Shut it down. <laughs> like, what are some of the challenges you face? It's a great question. And I, I, I want to answer that by saying I have interviewed people now who have come through the most harrowing things I could e even fathom. I couldn't even imagine what these, what these things have gone through. I no longer view challenge or adversity as a weakness. I actually view it as a strength. It's like any time that you feel like, oh my God, I can't believe I've been hit with this again. The universe has presented you with a problem that you need to solve that will make you stronger, more resourceful and more resilient, like we mentioned earlier, to be able to move forward. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think about these things. Um, now, that being said, this has been like this year now when everything's great, this has been one of the toughest years, if not actually, no, this would be by far um, since, you know, I, I, let me, let me sort of take you back a bit actually, Ken. So yeah. when I, when I was in high school, um, I used to have these things where I would faint and I would throw up randomly. It was a really weird, it was a really weird thing. And it was only when I got older, I realized it was this crippling anxiety 
condition. There were times when, you know, you'd be doing an exam uh, in, in high school at a really critical time in, in your life. I had to put the, you know, put my hand up in front of hundreds of other people to be like, I need to go to the, the sick bay. I feel like I'm mm. going to faint and throw up. And then 15 minutes after that, you're fine. The only thing you've got to show for it is that you've just, you know, ruined the exam that you were, that you were there for. And you associate those feelings of what happened to not wanting to Whoa. I don't know what just happened. Can you guys still hear me? James, I, I don't know what happened. You're frozen. Um, can you hear me? Let me know in the comments if you can still hear me. It looks like James had a computer crash or something. Well, shoot. That stinks. I don't know what happened. Um, if he comes back, we will bring him back on. That's 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 terrible. I don't know what. Yeah, he's he's gone. Well, shoot. That stinks, stinks, stinks. Um, let me see if. Um, let me see. Hmm. I'm frozen now too. Really? Um, okay. Well, we're going to have to possibly uh, reschedule or see if we can get James back on. Oh, there, 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 there he is. Hold on. Hold on. James. Can you hear me again? Yes. Oh, good. I'm so sorry about that. The power went out. In the entire, it's a beautiful day here in California. I, I don't know what happened. That literally hasn't ever happened before. So I, I oh. apologize for that. The universe couldn't handle our, couldn't handle our, our conversation. But uh, yeah. so I was, I was getting, where I was sort of finishing off before. It was yeah. um, as a result of those feelings that happened during the exam. It then meant that I had absolutely no desire to prepare for those things because it was the preparation that would bring back those feelings of what would happen during it. So a complete recipe for disaster. And yeah. I've sort of self-diagnosed so much later through life that just as we can think and grow rich, we can think and grow poor. And that's what I was doing for like the first 22, 23 years of my life. I was yeah. thinking and growing poor. I was in survival mode. And it was only at the age of 23 when I basically at absolute rock bottom um, from how that anxiety disorder had manifested and how I was just eating crappy food and not hanging around the right people and drinking too much and all of those different things that I basically said, look, I'm, I'm not going to live like this anymore. And I was literally had tears rolling down my eyes. And um, I didn't wow. have, I didn't, I didn't go down the medication route. I've, I've had friends who have gone down the medication route, which, which went well for them, but I just, it was just not something that I haven't really sort of entertained because I purely, because I didn't want to be in the situation where I was facing something and didn't have the medication and all of a sudden that would come rushing back. I didn't want to, to be dependent on that. So that impacted my life in insurmountable ways. Like I, I, I really, um, I often think that um, what would life look like if I hadn't had that crazy defining moment in my life? And then it turns out many wow. years after that, Success Magazine reached out and said, we want to feature you in the summer 2019 issue when the you know think and grow rich the legacy book came out and i was like what am i going to write about and i had someone reach out to me and say you've spoken so much about interviewing other people's stories what about your story and i realized it was the thing that i had kept hidden because i was embarrassed and ashamed about it because i came from a good family in a good country and a good school i had absolutely everything that i that i needed to succeed yeah and i wasn't even close to to success as a result of those things so i didn't feel worthy of of that because there's a lot of people who have, who have overcome so much more and i was able to share that and they gave me three pages in the in the print copy of the magazine which was great and then um and then this year which i sort of alluded to earlier the things that's been really tough for me is that we have a, a three-year-old daughter now and we have a, a seven-month-old and just the, the challenge of, of parenting. Like I, I thought I knew stress working a full-time job. I thought I knew stress being a business owner. I thought I knew stress with one kid. 
now with two kids, with, with everything that's going on, I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp on, on what stress actually is. But our, our, um, our baby boy, who you know, he's a, he's a healthy, very happy kid, but he still wakes up two, three, four times a night, which just means you, you, you know, you're sort of playing defense every day. And um, yeah. our toddler just started preschool, so all of the feelings and, and emotions and everything that, that comes with that. So as a household with two working parents trying to figure all this out has led to a lot of – um, just a lot of conversations and things about what is the lifestyle that we that we want to have, and what are the conversations that we want to have with each other, and and where are we at? Which these are good times to have those conversations, um, but the stress that that has brought on. Everyone says you need to you need to have kids to experience life and and everything else, but they never talk about the stress that 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 brings in. It, it can be yeah. I, I can easily see for a lot of people how it would be how it would be too much. So this this year for me actually for the um, for the back half of this year I've actually cleared a lot of my plate just so I can I want to be there to drop my daughter off to preschool and pick her up every single day. Um, I want to be able to you know do things like cook meals in the in the home and just do a, a lot of things like that because I, I I didn't realize until recently a lot of the stress that I was carrying subconsciously and how those things had, had sometimes manifested in the home nothing you know nothing too bad but just being too irritable and and too no tell me his power did not go out again. What is happening in this interview? I, I, I'm, oh. I'm here. Oh. <laughs> they're, they're, the universe, is, is something is, is trying to stop this today. Um, is, that, is that better, oh, Ken? Better, we, better. We back? You're back. You're back. You're back. You're <laughs> I'm back. sorry. I've got no idea what is, what is going on. It's usually very reliable, <laughs> but I know the tech gods it's, can have some, some interesting things in mind. You know, I, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking like, you know, because I, I have two kids. Wait till they're 16 and 12. Holy Ooh. crap. Um, Everyone keeps telling me that. <laughs> wait for, wait for the, oh. the teenage years. But, you know, I, I think about like the people who when I when I interview somebody, I always sit here and I think, man, do they have it figured out? <laughs> Cause we're all like, I think we're all trying to like just get through life and go, what's the reason and how do we, what's, and I look at somebody like Ramey, right. Uh, who's, who's talk about a story, but I look at somebody like him and I think he has no attachment to things at mm. all. Like none. He, I said, Hey, I'm going to borrow your Bentley when we were there. And he's like, Hey, here's the keys. <laughs> I'm like, really? I, I was kidding. He's like, go ahead. And he does not care. He's not yeah. attached to things, you know? And, and I, I just wonder, like, as you coach people and you teach people to win the day, um, is that part of what you like, you know, try to let go of your attachment to the outcome? Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely. Because high achieving people who are the ones that I, that I have coached, yeah. these are the people who the moment they achieve something, they just throw that carrot again, off into the, off into the distance. You are always chasing something yeah. and it's never enough from a, from a, a career standpoint. So the very yeah. first thing that I do with the clients that I, that I work with, I'm you know, more than happy to, to sort of reveal some of those things here. Yeah. We get yeah. the people who feel like they're treading water. It's because of two things. They're not clear on who they are and they're not clear on where they want to go. So that's the very first thing we do. We figure out who are mm -hmm. you and where you want to go. We tie that into your purpose and we create like a personal mission for you. Like what do you put on this earth to do mm. and what are the standards that you are going to set and how do those standards dictate the decisions that you make every single day, which will then determine your actions, which will determine your habits, which will determine everything else. And as part of that, what I do every morning, um, my morning routine, it starts off with the acknowledgement phase. So acknowledging that if you do not make the decision to win, you have automatically made the decision to lose. So that's it. I acknowledge that that is that, is that battle between good and evil, and I'm going to win today. It's why I have win the day written on my oh, wrist on this see. client tent bracelet. Oh, that's Whoops. What am I awesome. doing here? <laughs> that's awesome, man. 
You so sell those? The, Do you sell I, those? I don't. Myintent.org, I think is it's my intent is the name of the company. And I think myintent.org okay. is the is the place. So that's it. I look at that every single day and I make the decision to win. And then I have the sacrifice phase, which is a cold shower. So for two years now, I've been doing cold showers every oh. single morning. So uh, and I, I should say there are places where uh, in the world where the water gets unbelievably cold. So you just want to do something that's uncomfortable for you. So it's an uncomfortable cold shower <laughs> every morning. And then after that, I get a little bit of sunshine. I do my journal where I write down what's a recap of the last 24 hours. I write down what I'm grateful for. What three things am I going to do to win today? What is the affirmation or intention that I want to carry for today? And then what is a lesson that I have from the last 24 hours if, if there is a lesson from, from life? And what I encourage all of my clients to do when they write down what are their three things that are going to make today a win that you never make them about the same category. Like don't make them all about work. Don't make them all about fitness. Don't make them all about family. What's one thing for your business? What's one thing for your mental health? What's one thing for your family? Like just, just mix them up to make sure that you're moving forward on those, on those different things. And then you do your life's work before your busy work. Most people wake up and they just, they're playing defense the whole day, checking emails and doing all of those different things. Do your three things that are going to help you win the day. Do the things that are going to move you closer to the life that you that you want. And above all, just be present with your with your family. And uh, particularly during COVID, I want to mention this. Like the last two and a half years has been unbelievably disruptive. A lot of people have have lost loved ones and haven't been able to. You know, I, I it's been a long time since I was able to see my family. Two years, two and a half years before I was able to see my my family. Eleven nieces wow. and nephews in in Australia and my parents. Um, so to go back and see them early this year was was great. So it's important to double down on on self care, and that's what I'm. Yesterday I was uh, I was with Rob Angel, who's the founder of Pictionary. We went to a place called Pause Studio where you do like a one hour infrared sauna and uh, cold wow. plunge. You sort of alternate between both, and you feel you feel so great as as a result of doing something like that. So that's a, that's a bit of an insight into into what I do and, and how I help my clients. Sounds like some Jesse Itzler stuff, right? It there. does. It does. I love he, Jesse. Yes, he's constantly sure. doing a cold plunge, and I love Sarah. And her her narration of his life <laughs> is so funny. So so let me, as you were talking a minute ago, um, you said the first two things that you do is, is say it again one more time is the acknowledgement phase, making the decision to win, or you've automatically made the decision to lose, and then the sacrifice f uh, phase, something uncomfortable to prove that you've turned up for the day. I, I think it, uh, we were talking about when you when you take on a new client or, you know, the first two things you do, um, I forget what they were, but one of them was something about your purpose, yeah. right? What about people who, the how many, I, I want to know how many people come to you and say, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't, and, and that's huge, right? Like people don't, I don't think, people know for sure it's a it's a great question ken and uh, a lot of people need to focus on self-care first of all when that happens because that awareness piece like you're bringing an enormous amount of stress into every and your own complexity yeah. into every environment you're in so what we want to try and do through the self-care method is to unravel that noise and that that turmoil and that stress that you feel inside and then from a place of a little bit of clarity, that's when you can write down, well, what are the things that I, that I want to, that I want to do in life and who do I want to do them with? And when do I want to do them by? And what are my values? What are the things that I absolutely stand behind? So for me, that's things like integrity, being true to your word, things like enthusiasm, um, constant growth. Like these are the values that I have. And then I'm um, taking that and, and I have sort of worksheets and things that I that goes into that in a lot more detail, but that'll give you a really good start. That's and then right. from there, something that Stephen Kotler recommends is just grabbing a, a piece of paper and literally handwriting. What are 25 areas that you're interested in? You know, not being crazy specific, but still at least a little bit specific. And then um, the problems that you want to solve and finding the intersections between 
those different things. And when you can start to do that, your brain is naturally going to look for the different connections, like that pattern recognition as you go about life. And that's when you can start to piece together your, your purpose and the meaning that you want to do. And uh, I'm a huge believer in writing, I have something called a success plan template. So I do that at least once a year. It's actually available for free um, on the link in my bio on Instagram. And I do that with my wife once a year where we do it individually, where we each write down what's, what are all the goals and things that we, that we have. And then we discuss that together what are those you know i need to know what's important to her and she's very big on career and these different things what's important to me that's going to be things like having the freedom to do the things that, that i want to do yeah and we talk about those things together and what life we want for our our family and um then you turn those into quarterly markers because a lot of people who are just so focused on goals but don't have purpose fail to recognize that goals are really just markers on the path once you have found your purpose and your meaning so I, uh, yeah, that's just a few things that'll, that'll hopefully help some people. Do you think there's a fast track to finding your purpose, an easy way to find it? Yeah. So many people are, are busy trying to force it. And sometimes yeah. it's like, you know, you can be in the shower and you're like, oh my God, I, I, that's my purpose. Or I've got this, this great idea that can, <laughs> that can happen. You don't yeah. find it by sitting on your ass doing nothing. I feel like you need right. to go out there. You've got to go on attend events. You've got to watch TED Talks. You've got to go and meet a bunch of different people. You've got to say yes to life and go and do those different things. And along the way, through the conversations that you have, when you're clear on the problems you have, you can start to do all of those different things. It was 33 years on this planet before I was able to figure out what my purpose was. And that was helping people win the day after a whole bunch of random things that brought me into that personal development world. Yeah. And one of my favorite quotes from Steve Jobs is that you can never connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking back. And you asked that question of like, what qualified me to be able to write Think and Grow Rich to Legacy? Yeah. And I had accumulated all of those dots and it was only looking back. I was able to say, ah, that's what I was doing those things for. It meant that I was ready for that opportunity and experienced enough to be able to present them with an idea that brought it right back on me to be able to be given that opportunity. Wow. Bob says, finding purpose is in your association with people like Ken and James. He oh, I love it, Bob. And you too, my friend. I love Bob. He was he was on a my wife did something really cool last night. Bob was on there last night. It was incredible. Um, so so James, I, I want everybody. Um, first off, everybody needs to see the movie. I, I'm a very visual person, so I like I like movies. Um, I like I've never even listened to one of my own podcasts because I hate <laughs> listening. I hate listening to podcasts. It's crazy. And who, who loves the sound of their own voice as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I love watching videos and your movie, the, the Think and Grow Rich movie is just incredible. And I highly recommend it to everybody. Where can people find that movie? Uh, tgrmovie.com I think is, is where it's at but if you search for Think and Grow Rich the, the legacy it's available now in a, in a bunch of different languages you'll be able to check it out that's awesome and the book obviously is on Amazon um, yeah. I'm an Amazon influencer also so if you ever want to do a live stream on Amazon we can do that as well so um, I just want to say thank you for coming on and, um, and sharing I, I feel like I could talk to you all day like you just have so much wisdom and I love your energy. So thank you for coming on today and sharing with everybody. Well, thanks for everything you're doing, Ken, to make the world a brighter place. I'm grateful that you uh, that you had me on and deeply honored to be here with you. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that you were here. So if you'll hang on for me, I'm going to end the live stream and um, just hang tight for me and let's, let's chat for a minute. But everybody that's been on here, make sure you go to jameswit.com reach out to James. You can get a signed copy of the book. I'm going to buy a signed copy of the book from you. Um, so I, I just thank you for being here. Thank you everybody for watching and we will see you all later. Thank you, James. <laughs>